Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. Today, we have a very special episode because we're going to dive deep into the industry of mining. Mining is one of the most mysterious and elusive topics that as much as we know about it, there's so much that we don't know. And Andrew Kegel, who is the founder and CEO of Hut 8 Mining. Hut 8 Mining is a Canadian mining consortium that trades publicly on the Toronto Stock Exchange. They have at any given point, one to 3% of the global mining market share, almost a thousand petahashes, and they've mined over 12,000 Bitcoin. Andrew, I have to say, I was very impressed by how he answered these questions. He he only entered our space two years ago, and I can honestly say that he knows more about mining than I do, and I've been in this space almost 10 years. He was able to answer the questions and give information that I simply didn't even know existed. We really talked about like how the miners are preparing for the halving towards the end of the episode. We talked about that. We talked about, um, we went through the actual financials of quarter by quarter of what does it cost to mine a Bitcoin? What does it cost per Bitcoin? You'd be very surprised how the cost to mine one Bitcoin changes so significantly every month. It's so cool. We talked about how they make money and how to actually build a Bitcoin mining data center. We talked about how they partnered with Bitfury two years ago to take on Bitmain, and they've been doing it extremely successfully. I don't want to tell you anymore because I want you to listen to the episode. So check out my ads, give some love to my sponsors, and I'll talk to you guys in a minute and a half. How do you actually live your life on crypto? How do you do it? I've been doing it since I first got started with Bitcoin back in, what, like 2011. But since 2016, I've been using the BitPay debit card to spend my Bitcoin on a day-to-day basis. And it's been such a great product that I've been using it for over three years. BitPay is now sponsoring Untold Stories, and they're going to be giving away free Visa debit cards to all my listeners. All you have to do is visit BitPay.com forward slash charlie it's such an easy card to use you get the card in the mail you download the bitpay app you put bitcoin on the app and when you want to send bitcoin from the app into your debit card it only takes a few seconds and you can spend your bitcoin anywhere credit cards are offered it's really so easy you almost wonder like why didn't this come out in 2011 when Bitcoin first launch? Well, it was very difficult to do. In fact, I actually tried to launch my own debit card, but I wasn't able to because the credit card companies were very reluctant to do it. But now BitPay launched their product and a lot of other companies have launched credit cards and debit cards using Bitcoin over the years. I still will only use the BitPay card. I'm very loyal to the brands I like um, and I hope you guys are too. The fees are very low. You can use it to withdraw cash at ATMs. You can use it all around the world with very, very low fees. A lot of companies have tacked on like super high fees, and I don't like that. So check it out. BitPay.com forward slash Charlie. That's BitPay.com forward slash Charlie. You get a free card. You don't have to pay for it. Usually the card costs like 10 bucks or more. There's a commitment but you don't have to do that here. It's a free card. There's literally no reason to not try it out. I've been using it for over three years. So check it out. You're a super loyal podcast listener and you've been listening to my show for a while. So you know that Bitpanda, which is a company based out of Austria, has been working with me for a few months now. And I'm a huge fan of Vienna and I'm a huge fan of Bitpanda. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Bitpanda is the leading European platform for investing in digital assets. Their core product is an easy to use crypto on-ramp and digital asset broker. They have over a million users, so you know they really care about their customers. What's amazing about Bitpanda is really how easy it is to set up an account and get going. They recently launched their own educational platform, and this is super cool, so check it out. Take a listen for a second, where you can learn all about Bitcoin and more. It's free, regularly updated, and you can earn five euro for free when you complete the quiz. So make sure you check it out, bitpanda.com. They are a big sponsor of ours and please give them some love because they love me. 
Over the years, a lot of companies have tried doing crypto social networking. But the problem is that there are a lot of really good social networking apps already out there, like Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat. How do we build a social network that's perfect for crypto? Well, I want to talk about Pepo, our newest sponsor of Untold Stories. Pepo is an amazing social media app that's built for the crypto community. What's really cool about it is that you can get rewarded for uploading and putting out good content, and you can also reward with crypto people who put up content that you really, really like. It's fast and simple, and it's the first crypto-powered app to be approved by the Apple and Google app stores. You can find me on Pepo right now at Charlie Shrem, the same handle as my Twitter, and I'm going to be posting interviews, travel videos, and more. So make sure you check out Pepo. It's super cool. Pepo.com. Enjoy it. Untold Stories wouldn't be here without the amazing production company, Blockworks Group. A few months ago, I approached Blockworks Group and I said, hey guys, I want to do a show, Untold Stories. Can we make it happen? And these guys are the only event and podcast production company that I trust. Really, the show is powered by them and it wouldn't be here today without the amazing work of the Blockworks Group team. So for access to all the premier digital asset conferences and to check out their other podcasts in their network that they produce, check them out at blockworksgroup.io. That's blockworksgroup.io. I promise you will not be disappointed. One of the most you know, reclusive or mysterious topics that we cover on this show um, every few months is Bitcoin mining. Mining is one of those things that I still feel like people don't understand why it's important. People don't understand how it works, um, the cost of, of mining a Bitcoin, what goes into it, the regulatory factors around it. There's a whole industry based on the security of our whole network and protocol. And one of the most important and largest companies in the world um, is a company called Hut8. And we're very fortunate to have the CEO of Hut8, Andrew Kegel, on the show today. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, Charlie, a pleasure to be on. Andrew, Hut8 has grown to become um, the world's largest publicly traded crypto miner um, by market capitalization and size of, of operations. And you only launched in 2017. The The whole concept of giving... Um, non-crypto people, non-crypto people. And there needs to be a better word for that. Um, exposure to this industry through a publicly traded vehicle. Um, it's a very novel approach. And it was something that not only with mining, but with other aspects of this industry that a lot of people were trying to do for uh, a very long time. So I wanted to ask you, tell me about where the idea came from and how it gets started. And then we can segue into how you guys have been able to leverage Canada. And it's not only cold weather and cheap hydroelectric power, but also the Toronto Stock Exchange. Yeah. Um, so I don't come to crypto from a traditional means. I was an investment banker for 21 years in Toronto. And uh, I was first introduced to to Bitcoin through um, this 3IQ fund, which is, is now out there and trying to get listed. And that was in around 2016. And just like everybody else, I was really dismissive of it. I was like, this is a Ponzi scheme. This is, you know, I, I didn't understand it. And very much like other people, the more you dive into it, the more you really start, you know, getting excited about Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency. So... At the time, and I don't know if you remember, there was a company called Hive, which was backed by Genesis Cloud Mining, and they were the first publicly listed. I company. remember Hive, Hive Mining, correct? Yeah, that's Whatever right. Whatever happened to them? They're still around. They're, okay. they're having some issues. Um, they were primarily they were they were mining uh, Ethereum, and I, yeah, I just think with with <laughs> that's yeah. not going <laughs> to that would be so. some problems there. Yeah. And I think they're mining a bunch of other stuff, but they're, they're good guys and we consider them friends. So, you know, everybody, look, everybody got hurt very badly in 2018 and in the beginning of this year. So, but anyway, so we, we were looking at the time and Hive at the time was trading at about a hundred million dollars a megawatt on the stock exchange. So to put that in perspective, that would have made us today wow. about a $10 billion company. 
and I was sitting with uh, some clients. We we were raising a lot of money at, at I was at a place called GMP, and we were raising equity for all kinds of different blockchain companies, and we were trying to find ones that were doing things the right way. There was a lot of examples of guys doing things wrong. Um, and we wanted to sort of say, like, how, how do we figure out a way to do this right and give people exposure to Bitcoin? Because we would go out and as, as a banker, by this time, this was 20, early 2017, you know, I was excited about it and, and my colleagues were excited about it. But you would talk to doctors, lawyers, accountants, cab drivers, and everybody said, I want to buy it, but I don't know how. And I would always ask, have you tried to buy it? All those people they, you just mentioned, doctors, lawyers, taxi drivers, those are the most boring people, too. So you got to, if you well, can get them. <laughs> that's right. Well, some of no them, some of them are. No offense to any taxi right. drivers or doctors <laughs> or lawyers. Well, you could say that about investment bankers too, but um, anyways, but it, it was just, they said it was always the same thing. I tried to buy it. I had to wire money somewhere. I wasn't sure where I was sending my money to and I gave up. So he said, why don't we create a vehicle that's public and then you could buy your Bitcoin exposure the same way you might hold, you know, Apple or, you know, any other stock. And that was really the genesis of the idea was how, how do we bring this in the right way to, you know, to educate and, and bring it to sort of more the, the traditional investor. Um, and that was the genesis of it. Now in Canada, to your question at the time I mentioned, we raised, when I was at GMP, we raised close to a billion dollars of equity for different groups, including guys like Mike Novogratz and Hive. And the reason why, and, and a lot of this is the genesis why a lot of the companies exist today, C Canada has this capital pool program, which is, is called, they're called CPCs, and it's like a SPAC. It's like an empty shell looking for a company. And what's unique about this is when you, when you do these reverse takeovers into one of these empty shells, you don't have to go through the regulator. Now, I'm sure you're aware and listeners are aware, you know, dealing with the SEC or different regulators around the world is, uh, you know, it's it's a process that is brutal and generally you don't get approved. I'm familiar with the process that you described in Canada. Um, when governments open up the ability to make business more streamlined, um, sometimes it can be abused or, 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 you know, kind of turned off and then the whole the, the whole system that, that was being done is gone. Um, it seems like over the years, Canada has been able to like, not just, um, keep on top of it, but it's, it's flourished. Have, have you seen that? Yeah. So this was a program. It was the CPC capital pool program was established about 40 years ago to help venture companies like new, new startups. So abuse yeah, I mean, you could say there's been some some companies that are questionable that have used this program, um, and they'll continue to be. But there is a level of regulation that's still there. You just don't need the regulatory approval that you would, per se, like as if you were trying to list in the United States. So it's just a, a much lower standard. Very interesting. Um, okay, so you and, guys... There was, I was going to say there was probably like 25 to 30 different blockchain companies that utilize this mechanism. And in 2017, the, the money was coming out of everywhere. Like everybody wanted access to these companies um, and they were throwing money at everything. And I would say today, probably 90% of them are gone. The way you guys set yourself apart from looking at your numbers uh, up until quarter three of 2019, you've you've mined over 12,000 Bitcoin. And the most recent numbers show me that you guys are a little um, under a thousand petahashes so you know, around 900 something, depending on the, the, you know, what the hash rate is of the day, that's, that could be one to two, you know, percent of the whole hash rate market share. That's a, that's a significant amount, especially since you guys came online, uh, you know, only two years ago or a little over two years ago, uh, very strategic. Uh, one of the most strategic things that you guys did was partnering with Bitfury. Uh, Bitfury is one of the, is the, one of the oldest, probably the first, mi I think it's the first mining pool right now. Slush was, slush was, but it's one of the earliest miners, mining pools and mining manufacturers. So you guys working with them, um, to, I guess, take on Bitmain. So, I mean, like HUD 8 plus Bitfury is the Canadian or North American version of Bitmain, and you guys are taking that on. Uh, where did you get introduced to Bitfury, and how did you guys decide to work together and to take and to take on this this huge project? Yeah, well, 
we, we wanted to do things the right way. And as a banker, I kept seeing these people wanting to come in and, and set up mining operations. They wanted capital from for mining. And they were not guys that really had any background in the space. So, you know, there's things when you're setting up a data center, like static proof floors, ceiling heights, air circulation. It's, it's a complicated thing. And they were simplifying it way too much. So when creating HUD-8, we said, What do you mean why don't we, they were simplifying it way too much? Well, they were like, we can just find a warehouse somewhere around the world. We'll just plug in a bunch of, you know, Bitmain com- machines and way to go. You know, we'll start printing money. Wait, it doesn't um, work like that? <laughs> no, it doesn't, Charlie. It doesn't. It's a, it's a lot more complex. And you got, you know, there's got to be some thought behind it. And we didn't have the technology or the experience. So we said, why don't we take the technology risk away from investors and, and contact someone who has been doing this for a long time? As you said, Bitfury has been doing it for a long, long time. Oh, forever. Val yeah. and, and George and everyone. Oh, my God. They're forever. Yeah. I think longer yeah. than and me, they, even. And, and they've got some great backers. Um, you know, they had the relationship with Mike Novogratz and Bill Ty. And so it's actually a funny story. So we originally, we, we just reached out to them. It was really more of a, a cold call where we said, here's really? what we're doing. We, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was through a, a mutual acquaintance, Mark Vanderchais. I don't know if you know him. He's a big Bitcoin guy. I don't know, but thank you, Mark, for doing that. Um, yeah. So he made the introduction and... And Mark ended up being one of the co-founders along with his partner, Mark, uh, Sean. And we flew out to uh, the Ukraine and we met them in, um, in Kiev. And it was a very funny story. So we sat there, we pitched them the idea. We said, we think we can raise a whole bunch of money in Canada for you guys. Um, they got excited by that. And, um, you know, I, I remember the time, I mean, this is a, f- a funny untold story. In Kiev, a lot of the, the businesses done at these like bathhouses outside of the, the city. And so about six of us went there and we, you know, I was there, we had our, our books and our presentations. And basically, you know, you strip down, you put on these towels and you go into this hot room with a big bottle of vodka. And we just started doing shots and eating Ukrainian food. And at the end of that meeting, we had the name of the company, the structure, how it was going to be run, everything set up. Um, we flew to Tbilisi, which is uh, the Republic of Georgia. I just drank Beautiful some great city. Georgian wine. Uh, a friend of mine runs a hedge fund out there, and he sent me a nice Georgian wine. George, I want to go to Georgia. It's beautiful. It is. Tbilisi was one of the nicest cities I've ever seen, and, and that's where Georgia's from. And so uh, there were some operations there. We went, we did some due diligence, and you know, by the end of that meeting, I think – Having spent some time together, we said, yep, these are the, the right partners. I think they thought the same about us. And, and that's how we kicked it off. So, and then what happened next? We came back. We Then we had to sort of try and raise the first round of money. They already had some assets in, in Alberta that were operating. Um, and we decided to give Mike Novogratz a call. So Mike Novogratz had already had a, a relationship with the guys at Bitfury. He saw what we were doing. He got really excited about it. And we convinced them to come sit on the board and roll in a bunch of his mining assets. Uh, Bill Tai came next. And I don't know if you know Bill Tai. Bill Tai is a, a legendary venture investor from Silicon Valley um, who was the first employee at Taiwan Semiconductor way back when. Is a legendary chip designer. And so he knows chips. He um. knows chips. And he's, uh, he's on the board of, of Bitfury as well. And he agreed to come on to invest and come on as the chairman. So we had everything formulated. We negotiated an exclusivity with the Bitfury guys. We thought that would be important. And we went to do the first capital raise, which was about 38 million Canadian, call it 30 million US. And Charlie, we we had a billion dollars of demand coming in from all over the world. This is November 2017, which I'm sure you recall what the, the crypto market was oh, doing wow, there. Oh, yeah. So we had a billion dollars of demand. People were fighting to try and get into this deal. Um, How has that changed? So, like at the at the depth of the bear market, I mean, we swing super bearish and then we swing back super bullish, like within hours. I mean, what was 2019 like in terms of uh, what you guys were looking at a bear market? Did you have investors that wanted out that just didn't believe? I mean, those doctors, lawyers, taxi drivers, what... 
What were they thinking? What were your investors? What about employees? That that. What about yourself? I mean, you came into into this industry in 2017, like you said, you came from a whole different world. Um, to, do you think our industry is like? Do you think we're here to stay, or um, or is this is like a fad? So absolutely. Uh, I think Bitcoin is here to stay. There's, there's no question in my mind. I love this guy, um, Wayne. I love him. He's already so, a maximalist. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm an absolute I'm maximalist. And, but I, I had always thought that I mean, when you look f- three, four, five years down the road, it, it's abs- ludicrous to think that there will not be a, a, some kind of a single or, or multiple uh, cryptocurrencies that you can use all over the world. Like whenever I travel, I always think it's ridiculous having to go to these money exchange places. And I, you know, you're paying 10% here and 10% there. It, it doesn't make sense. So Bitcoin is, is here to stay for sure. In terms of the mining, they go hand in hand. So the, the mining has to continue to stick around. And, it, you know, we, we validate the blockchain. Um, we, every time there's a, a block that's done, you need miners. So in terms of the investors, back to your question, I mean, we were a public company and we saw our share price get hit. And in fact, this was not a great year for the share price. Um, and it's moved similarly to Bitcoin. It's gone from 70 cents to $3. And I think it's at around a, a dollar now. So we live through those vol- that volatility as well. But everybody knows what they're getting into. It's true. Everyone does know what they're getting into, especially when they're investing in something that's that's publicly traded. I, I own shares of a of a company in, uh, in Canada. So my whole life, I've never, never had a trading account. Like I've never traded stocks. Um, cause when I, you know, basically became an adult, I got into Bitcoin. Um, and then I worked for, for, I did some work for a company. It's also publicly traded on the TSX. Um, and, uh, um, and they, they gave, you know, I got awarded shares and I had to like set up a whole uh, account and everything just to be able to trade in and out of those shares. Um, so it's it's super cool, and but you're right. Like I know what I'm getting into. Unlike, uh, and I can see why you're a maximalist. You probably deal with a lot of people who who got screwed maybe in the ICO market. Um, but I wanna I wanna kind of jump into the numbers for a second. Um, so I'm looking at basically your you know 2009 financials, and this is super intriguing. I think I think these are some type of things that people really don't understand. Um, and so like, let's kind of jump into this for a second. So we're, we're looking at quarter one, two, and three of 2019. Obviously we're in the middle of quarter four, so we can't talk about those things yet. Um, your revenue from quarter one to quarter three basically doubled. It went from, from $12 million to $26 million. Um, your, your profit, you know, same thing. It went up exponentially. Um, why? Take me through 2019. I mean, we're in a bear market. If I look at your your cost to mine Bitcoin when you first started in 2019 was three thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars, but by quarter three reporting, it was at four thousand three, almost three four thousand. But in the middle of quarter two, it went down to twenty eight hundred. Kind of walk us through that. Like, why did the cost of per Bitcoin go down? Um, why did your numbers continue to go up? Did what type of your cost you know remain static? Take us into the business of Bitcoin mining, like the business of Bitcoin mining um, a decade into crypto. I still know nothing about. Yeah. So this is the stuff that that keeps me up at night and I have alarms and different things. I wake up, you know, this bothers my girlfriend immensely because <laughs> every two hours I wake up and I'm checking two things. I'm, I'm checking the, the network cash rate and the price of Bitcoin. And so to answer your question, like why does the cost move around? Um, our costs are pretty static. Like they're, they're flat. We, we have our monthly electricity price. We have our labor, our security. Uh, there's a little bit of overhead. It stays flat. What moves is the network hash rate. And the way I, I, des- I would describe it is, and the way I sort of describe it to people is approximately every 10 minutes, there is a lottery that occurs. And it's the, the, the Bitcoin crypto lottery where you have all these miners directing their hash and you're trying to, to, to guess that code. The more people that are trying to do that at the same time as you, the lower your likelihood is of winning, just like just any like, lottery. Yeah, just like a lottery. Perfect. Yeah. And so what happened during, uh, and, and then you have the price of, of Bitcoin, of course. What notionally happened, I think when, when the original white paper was created is, the thought was people were gonna be doing this out of their basements. And if it didn't become profitable, you just turn off your computer. But instead, what happened in 2017 is everybody raised all this capital. They bought all this equipment. The price of Bitcoin collapsed, as did all the the other 
uh, coins, but they were already stuck with their investment. So they just kept mining, even though they were losing money. And so that lottery ticket, too many people were mining and the reward was too small, made for a very unprofitable business in, in Q1 and through most of last year. What happened in Q2, if you recall, is when the, there was all the hype around the, the Libra and the Facebook and, and Bitcoin took a real fast jump. It started going up April 2nd. And by the middle of the summer, it was up around close to 14,000. I think it hit 13,800, um, which was a great price. Yeah. That's reflected in our Q2. So what happens in that standpoint is the hash rate hasn't caught up. And everybody starts that cycle again of trying to oh. order equipment to increase the hash. Do you, do you, did you find during, so basically the price, you know, rebounded, but uh, the hash rate didn't keep up with that. Did you, do you find that it was hard to find like parts or even, you know, actual uh, uh, chips or miners um, to do, you know, ASIC chips and everything to do, to do work? Was it hard to manufacture them or people were, because uh, now all of a sudden everyone wanted, like I find whenever the price is pumping, Everyone all of a sudden wants to get into mining, but they don't realize that it takes six months to a year. But by, by that time, the hash rate is already, um, it's a very long-term game. That's right. And, and then like back to, to the point, but I think when the original Bitcoin white paper was created, nobody anticipated this being a, you know, industrial scale business. The thought was guys are just in their basement. They'll just turn off their machine or you'll buy a couple. But will that happen? Like you guys are huge. I mean, what's your, what's your, I mean, if I look at, um, you guys are so big, you look at your revenue. I mean, just in, just, just, the, just in the first three quarters, it's $67 million. Right. So, um, if you, if at what price, if the Bitcoin price goes down to, would there be a scenario where you would literally just turn off the lights? Like that's the biggest fear that we'd go down to a point so low that miners would just turn off. Yes. The hash rate would uh, you know, significantly go down. And then the miners that are still there are making more money and things will balance itself out, but it would take a minute, right? It would take a few months. Maybe uh, Satoshi has it baked into it that um, the hash rate, the emergent Satoshi has something baked into the code that uh, the hash rate will check itself like an emergent, you know, if, so, if all the miners disappeared mm -hmm. or the double amount, if, if, if the hash rate doubled tomorrow, um, the hash rate has like a, a built-in checking mechanism, but I think there's like some sort of delay. I think it takes two weeks. Yeah, uh, it's it's approximately, so it's supposed to be every two weeks, but what happens, it's that, okay. that lottery. So if you have a bunch of people trying to guess that code, somebody wins it, it can be solved in three minutes. So the difficulty goes up approximately every two weeks, depending on that. So let's just say that all the blocks are being solved in eight minutes. That's too fast because the target is supposed to be 10 minutes. The difficulty increases. If people, if it's taking everybody 12 minutes to solve the block, then the difficulty decreases. And so back to what you're saying, I think what Satoshi envisioned was that it would be a self-regulating system. And this is part of the, the brilliance of, of Bitcoin is if too many people are mining, it gets harder to mine and everybody's costs go up in terms of, it, but it's not your, your actual fiat costs that are going okay, up. It just so means you're mining less coin. And so when so you if see, like, yeah, well, if, what, if you look at Q1, we were, our costs were the same. We were just mining less coin because the hash rate was too high in Q2 relative to the price in Q2, the price spiked and the hash rate didn't catch up. It took until Q3 for it to catch up. And then the price came down again. So being a miner is one of those funny things. You're either going to be, you know, really making a lot of money. Or, or not making very much money at all. That's so cool. Um, it's very so volatile. Like, I'm telling you, it's a, it's not, it's not for for you know the, the faint of heart. It's it's a tough business. What would so so walk us through two scenarios? What ha what would happen in a scenario if the hash rate doubles overnight and the hash rate that came on is like North Korea or someone that we don't want to be mining Bitcoin or whatever? Right. So from a mining perspective, if the hash rate doubled, uh, essentially our production of uh, Bitcoin would be cut in half. And so our costs remain the same, but we're mining 50 percent less Bitcoin, which means so mining would be slower. Right. It would be like to mine a block. It would slow down because there are more. Or no, that it, it wouldn't would really matter. Up. No, the block, the more miners oh. that are out there, the, the blocks speed up. 
And so you're competing against more people. So let's, you mentioned before, we were approximately 2% of the market. If we become 1% of the market, the amount of Bitcoin that is mined on a daily basis is relatively the same. It's about 1,800 coin a day. And so you're fighting for that same amount, but now you're fighting against twice as many people, you're going to get half as much. What would happen if 50% of the hash power disappeared overnight? What would happen in that situation? I'd be a very happy guy because it means that our costs remain the same, but I'm receiving twice as many Bitcoin every day. How do you actually live your life on crypto? How do you do it? I've been doing it since I first got started with Bitcoin back in what, like 2011. But since 2016, I've been using the BitPay debit card to spend my Bitcoin on a day-to-day basis. And it's been such a great product that I've been using it for over three years. BitPay is now sponsoring Untold Stories, and they're going to be giving away free Visa debit cards to all my listeners. All you have to do is visit bitpay.com forward slash Charlie. It's such an easy card to use. You get the card in the mail, you download the BitPay app, you put Bitcoin on the app, and when you want to send Bitcoin from the app into your debit card, it only takes a few seconds and you can spend your Bitcoin anywhere credit cards are offered. It's really so easy. You almost wonder, like, why didn't this come out in 2011 when Bitcoin first launched? Well, it was very difficult to do. In fact, I actually tried to launch my own debit card, but I wasn't able to because the credit card companies were very reluctant to do it. But now BitPay launched their product and a lot of other companies have launched credit cards and debit cards using Bitcoin over the years. I still will only use the BitPay card. I'm very loyal to the brands I like um, and I hope you guys are too. The fees are very low. You can use it to withdraw cash at ATMs. You can use it all around the world with very, very low fees. A lot of companies have tacked on like super high fees. And I don't like that. So check it out. BitPay.com forward slash Charlie. That's BitPay.com forward slash Charlie. You get a free card. You don't have to pay for it. Usually the card costs like 10 bucks or more. There's a commitment, but you don't have to do that here. It's a free card. There's literally no reason to not try it out. I've been using it for over three years. So check it out. And thanks for listening to Untold Stories. And I want to talk about Bitpanda for a second. I mentioned at the beginning of the show that we're working with them and we have been for a few months now. They love me and I love them. So I'm asking that you give them some love and some support, especially if you're listening from Europe. Bitpanda is the leading European platform for investing in digital assets. It doesn't hurt. Actually, it helps that they're based out of Austria, which is one of my favorite countries in the world. And Vienna is one of my favorite cities in the world to visit. I try to go as frequently as I can. And, you know, meeting up with the Bitpanda team is always a pleasure. I really like Bitpanda's approach. Why? Well, basically what they're doing is to apply the same tech that we're used to from Bitcoin and apply it to other digitized assets. And and I'll explain why. And, and if you check out their website, you'll understand how that actually works because they're really pushing hard for bringing crypto to the masses and, and educate people on the topic. Unlike other companies that just want to really give love to their customers, Bitpanda is giving love and, and, and spending money on mass adoption, just bringing more people into Bitcoin. With their recently launched educational platform, it's not only free, it's called Bitpanda Academy. It's not only free, but you'll actually learn and you'll earn five euro just for taking quizzes on their site. So it's a great way to force you to learn more about Bitcoin. Check them out. Again, they give me love. So I'm asking for you, my listeners, to give them some love. So in both situations, would the Bitcoin network ultimately be secure? I guess my question is, could this be an attack vector? Uh, You know, like somehow figure out a way to cut off hash rate or somehow coming online and and having, you know, equal hash rate, 51% even or 50% or 49% or whatever? I think the likelihood of that is is low. Um, I think probably 50, 60 percent of the mining still occurs in China, but even the Chinese are looking to move it into other countries, uh, particularly the U.S. I, I think the likelihood of that happening is is low. You'd have to get equipment. You like the amount of power you would require to double the hash rate is just enormous. So it it tends to happen over time. Wow. And there's websites you can go to. And you can see every two weeks has the has the hash rate, the difficulty going up or down. Yeah, I was looking at it this morning. Yeah. 
you can, for the listeners, you can check out, uh, just type in Bitcoin hash rate and there's a ton of sites you can see it and you can almost follow it. And then um, the HUD 8 uh, financials and investor presentations are public. You guys can go on and it's actually very cool. I was doing it this morning to overlay your your numbers and your peta hashes um, with that of the hash rate. It's actually very, very cool to see that, not just from a podcaster perspective, but just from someone, if you're a nerd or a geek, or if you like Bitcoin or crypto, it's actually very cool. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm very impressed about your knowledge of mining for someone who's very, you, you know, you came on to the, uh, into the stage uh, recently and not recently, like, like two years ago. Um, well, I guess you'd have to, because you're the CEO of, of the company. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so but, um, I wanted to ask you, can you walk us through? So right now you have two data centers. You have what you call Medicine Hat and you have Drum Drum Heller. Is that is that correct? Yes. Um, imagine tomorrow you were to uh, set up a third one. What would that look like from like your company perspective? Would you call up Bitfury and say, hey, we need to we need more chips? Like, would you scout a new location? Like, what does it take to put a Bitcoin data center with miners the proper way? online so you can break even as as fast as possible but also scale and feel free to take your time on this this is a super interesting question yeah so we're always looking at sites i've probably looked at 75 different sites in north america um you know from, from a hot eight perspective to expand i think we, we'd like to focus on renewable energy i think that's a key thing for the for the bitcoin ecosystem um and very low cost power. So we're looking at stuff like right now in Alberta in our Medicine Hat site. And I know I've, I've listened to your podcast. I know that you you, um, you you guys talk about some mining as well that's done in Texas. We're paying probably just over three cents a kilowatt hour in Alberta. So that's like real cheap. Um, the sites that we look at in the U.S. We've been looking at wind power uh, and hydro uh, energy. And we've been looking at it as well in that two and a half to three cent range. So to set something up, A, we need a lot of land. If, if you go to our website, we, we function a little differently. We, we don't have a big warehouse full of machines. We take 40 foot freight containers and we retrofit them to become sort of mini data centers. And inside, they're just full of motherboards. There's no people in there. So for listeners, mining for Bitcoin, it's not a guy sitting behind a computer typing away. These are just motherboards sitting there that run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They need a cool environment because computers give off a lot of heat. And so when we're looking at sites, we're looking for, A, is there a ton of land there for us to use? Both of our sites use, like I think Medicine Hat's 11 acres and Drumheller is about eight acres. And we just have these freight containers that are laid out and plugged into electricity sources and the internet. And so when we look at this stuff, we're looking at political environment. Is, is it, you know, a friendly place? You can get real cheap power in Venezuela, but no one's going there. Yeah, good point. Um, so you want political stability. You want low cost power uh, and you want a friendly business environment where the rule of law exists. And that's why I think you have a lot of uh, people who are mining who are looking at the U.S. Texas is going to be a real hot spot for for mining of, of crypto. But it's hot. It's hot, but you can build. So I think northern Texas is less hot. And if you can go to some higher ground, it's a little bit cooler and you can put in things like fans. So our equipment, uh, these freight containers on the one side, they're all air cooled. There's just fans that blow air through them and they're spaced out and the air blows through on one side. There's filters on the other side to keep dust out. And these things just operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. What type do you have staff that like lives on site? What type of uh, staff or, or, or people need to work there to to maintain. And I guess what's, do you have like a percentage of efficiency? Like for example, um, I know pool heaters only operate at 80% efficiency. Do you have a similar situation? Yeah. So I'll answer your first question. So generally the sites will have, at, you know, there's shifts and there's people there 24 hours a day. They're both located near relatively decent cities. Medicine Hat's about 60,000. I think from Heller's about 40 and it's, it's, it's engineers. So if anything goes wrong, so if a chip burns out on a machine, we have software there that monitors the temperature of everything going on. Uh, and if something goes wrong, we need somebody to go into the machines, pull out the motherboard, replace the chips, do the repairs. And then there's- I the, want to come tour your facilities. I, I want to come check this out. 
Oh, I could hook, I could hook that up in a second. I, I think it'd be great. Oh, yeah. You should come to the medicine hat one. I think the medicine hat sites pr- got to be one of the, the nicest mining sites in the world. And it's huge. Um, How far is it from Toronto or Montreal? So it's actually, it's about a three hour drive from Calgary, or you can take a little prop oh, plane there. Bad. Yeah. So if you, yeah, yeah. yeah, you get to Calgary and it's, a, it's about a 45 minute flight from, from there. And, but that it's would in be a cool. little like eight seater plane, very flat, very dry, but yeah, come, I'd say don't go there now. It's very cold. Um, uh, but if you want to come, uh, next year, I'd be happy to set that up. It's really neat. Yeah. That would be, that would be so cool to, to see that. Um, the only minor, so, um, Obviously, when when in 2011, when I got involved, um, everyone was a miner. When you download the software Bitcoin from Satoshi himself, uh, as soon as you turned it on, it was mining. Uh, I was mining on my CPU. Um, and then I did some GPU mining, but not really like just again, like leaving some graph, you know, some gaming PCs on. So you'd mine some Bitcoin. Um, and then I don't know if you've ever, ever had the chance to meet uh, a good friend of mine. His name is Yifu Guo. And he he, he was uh, he claims to be the, the inventor of the ASIC. Uh, chip um, or the the modern day iteration of it. And regardless of that claim, uh, you know, Avalon ASIC, um, when in 2012 or 2013, I forget the exact date, no one was mining with ASICs. Like it was all GPUs. Right. There was zero ASICs online. And I'll never forget Yifu. Yifu was this kid who was literally sitting for six months in my office. I mean, kid, I was in my 20s and he was younger than me in the BitInstant office. This is a true story. And he sitting there for months. He was like, I have a better way of mining Bitcoin. I have a more efficient way of mining Bitcoin. He was just saying it. And like, dude, like, no, you don't. Like, I'm my butterfly labs are coming in the mail. Those are going to be the <laughs> best Bitcoin miners. But he's like, no, no, I have a better way of mining Bitcoin. So the one day he calls me up and he goes, Charlie, I need you to pick me up. So he didn't even have a car. He didn't even own a car. He said, Charlie, come pick me up. I was like, where are we going? So picked him up in Brooklyn and we drove to JFK. I said, why are we going to JFK? He says, I need to go to the customs building. We go to the customs building. He goes inside, signs a bunch of paperwork, comes back out. And in the trunk of my car, he puts this like tower computer that like looks like half of it is missing. So it was like this tower that had no sides and then it's just this big thing in the middle. I'm like, what the hell is that? He goes, this is an ASIC. I was like, what the hell is an ASIC? And he goes, this is the second ASIC to ever come into the United States. This is the second ASIC in the world. The first ASIC, and this is publicly verifiable, he sent to Mike Hearn. Uh, hmm. And Jeff Garza got one too. I got the second or the third one. Um, and I was, and we plugged it in. And so in our office, we were mining like 30 Bitcoin a day the first few weeks. But then it got like too hot. It was summer. So we just turned it off. Right. Yeah. It was, and that's, and that's what happened, but Bitcoin wasn't worth much that was, so who cares? Right. And, uh, I think I forgot whatever happened to the miner. I think we gave it to one of the employees when he, should, I don't remember what happened should to create it. A, a Bitcoin museum and put it in there. Well, it's gone now. I th- I may know who has it, but I don't know if he still has it, but I may know who, who had it. Yeah. But, but you're right. It, everything was done by GPU. And then when the ASIC technology came along, it destroyed the ability really for, you know, doing this off of a computer became, you know, impossible because it was not just a small step change to go from a GPU to an ASIC. I mean, it was like two, 300 fold better. Andrew, if you, um, if, if we look at your industry though, and you, you know, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you, you're a CEO of a company, you're an officer, you're a professional, a uh, huge company, publicly traded, uh, adults, right. But you look at our industry, we're growing up. Um, but a lot of the, the different, uh, sub, industries, right? Or, you know, you have the mining industry, you have the exchange um, industry or, you know, financial services within crypto. Um, Mining, mining has grown up faster than all other aspects of our space. You're still having exchanges shut down. Yes, you're still having a lot of these like Ponzi schemes that claim to do mining. What, why do people fall for that? I mean, you look at Plus Token, um, OneCoin, all these Ponzi scheme scams that get, you know, caught up. Um, so many of them, they all claim to be doing mining. And it all goes back to what I said earlier, because mining is so mysterious and because people don't understand how it really works, it allows for scammers to come in and claim that they're mining Bitcoin when really they, they I mean, look at BitClub. Uh, were you familiar with BitClub? I was, uh, yeah. Did you ever tell me, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Where, when you heard about when that got shut down, were you just in awe? 
I think, you know, back to your original question, everybody operates looking for a quick buck. When you had these phenomenal returns occurring through Bitcoin at first and when with the altcoins, I remember guys who were, you know, four or five thousand percent returns a year. People are always looking for that quick buck. It's just economics, right? Um, it's it's very it's it's very much emotional. And I see that even with our site, people are always ripping off the HUD8 website and claiming like, send us money. This is cloud mining. And you know, we're constantly really? trying to shut people down. Absolutely. All over Asia, people are trying to rip off the HUD8 brand um, and s- suck money. And so I'm not surprised. And it's not that different. I, I mean, I think you're too young. But if you go back, I think it was like 1997, 1998, when the internet was first emerging. And you had all these also scam companies, right? Like give us money. We'll book this for you. We'll do that. And it's very similar when you have these new industries that the the charlatans are going to come out of the woodwork and, and sort of find ways to take money from people that are just misinformed um, and looking for a quick buck. I think that'll happen in any new industry. I don't think it's necessarily unique to, to crypto. And unfortunately, the numbers are big. Have you guys ever thought of doing a, and I guess, you know, it's interesting as I ask questions, sometimes I almost have my own answer or I realize that it's a stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyways, because it's my show and I can do whatever I want. <laughs> That's true. But had, did you guys, I mean, I'm sure you, you do uh, competitive research and then you have other, uh, you know, some of your colleagues or other companies in the space that are your competitors, right. That, that, that do mining too. Uh, did you guys ever consider creating an association type of thing? And then I realized that it's a stupid question because you'd basically be creating like a centralized place that a government can go to if they'd ever want to, you know, the, the biggest fear that Bitcoiners have is when one miner or a mining consortium has enough, uh, too much market share. And one of the biggest misconceptions, and it almost took down Bitcoin, was when people didn't people thought that mining pools had more power than they did, and they didn't realize that actually mining pools have a lot less power than we think they have. And that was a big thing. That was a big messaging. It's all about messaging. And I feel like if there's more data and information and messaging out there about how the mining industry works, you'd have a lot less scams. Yeah, that's a good point. There is still a lot of mystery around what mining is and 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 how you do this. But you know, the, the mining scams, there's been way more scams, I think, in other areas like exchanges. Like I'm sure you followed, you know, Quadriga. Oh, you're a thousand percent right. You know, like mining is one of those things where I think where people can get scammed. I mean, there was this big, the, the thing that brought, you know, the drop in Bitcoin supposedly last week or, you know, before the plus this month. token. Yeah, that's right. And so that whole thing is very, what, what was it like 17 million or something? I forget, I forget the number, but it was a huge amount. It's um, two two billion dollars total. Yeah, like these are just sh- last week they sold. Just last week they sold um, more than the total market capitalization of all of crypto. Two hundred million dollars just last week. Yeah, and, that, and that's insane that the system has still has these flaws in it. But the flaws, as I always tell people, the flaws are never with Bitcoin. Um, if I leave my wallet in the bathroom and it's got a bunch of cash in it, and I come back half an hour later and the cash is gone. That's not a flaw in the money. That's a flaw in, in my ability to, to keep my... Tell that to the right. mainstream media. Yes, because they're always, you know, I, I'm always having to explain to people, Bitcoin has never been hacked. And people are in disbelief. Well, I read this, I read about all these things and Mt. Gox and everything else. Bitcoin has always performed the way it's supposed to perform. I think the, we're still trying to figure out ways to secure it for people and make it more easily accessible. Wow. That's a very bold statement, but I, but I agree with you. We need to make it more accessible and we constantly need to. So I guess um, if I were an investor in, in HUD eight and I invested to buy, you know, because you're mining Bitcoin and I was listening to this, I would be happy that, you know, when you started out, you said, you know, and we were joking around, but you said, I'm a maximalist and, and, you know, I don't know how serious you were, but I could tell that you do believe that Bitcoin is, is the one. And, and, and I agree with you uh, completely. So I guess uh, I'm happy to, I'm happy to, to hear that. And I know that a lot of your investors are probably as well. Um, there was one technology when I was doing my research that I didn't understand. 
Um, I understand that it's 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 one of the things you know you and Bitfury together. It's a prior it's it's a proprietary technology, uh, and you call it your black box AC technology. Can you uh, explain to me what that is? And why it's so important that it was a whole slide in your investment deck? Yeah, so it's called a, a, a block box. Um, block box. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. So I'll, I'll tell you that how it came about from uh, Bitfury, and, and you you know Val and George, but they they had a facility that they built on some island in off the coast of Denmark or something like that. Oh yeah, I remember this. Okay. Yeah, and they found a whole bunch of as, asbestos in the walls, and they were like, you know, shit. Like we have all this equipment here. How do we transport this? And I think it was Val, you know, you know, a brilliant guy and said, why don't, instead of us building these, these buildings that are impossible to move, why don't we put these into portable uh, mobile containers? And that way, if anything goes wrong somewhere, we can just ship them off. Or if power becomes cheaper in another location, we just, you know, put it on a, you know, the, on a trailer and we could just move them around. And, and that's really the genesis of it. So while, you know, Bitmain, and I'm not knocking, I think there's a lot of great equipment out there, but if you're buying a Bitmain equipment or Canan or Wetsminer, you're, you're buying what they call a machine. And you, you get that thing, yeah. which you described, which has the fan, you have to plug it in, you got to stack them and store them, and the chips are inside. Once the hash rate increases and the efficiency and the technology improves, you got to pull that thing out of the wall and throw it out. What's a little bit different about this technology is it's each of these block boxes, these 40 foot containers is almost like its own self-contained miner. There's no machines in there. There's just chips. And so when it comes time to upgrade, which, you know, miners have to do frequently, you just pull out the motherboard, put a new motherboard in with different chips and then keep going. We don't have to order all of that machinery and all the things that go around the chips because that's the actual freight container. Whoa. And is this something that can be replicated? And you talk about Asia and Bitmain. Is this something that can be replicated by other people? I think they could replicate it. I know there's other companies out there that have looked at it. Um, so th there's some stuff that's proprietary on the inside in terms of how it's laid out. But I think people have copied this idea. But I don't but know. But that's your that industry, Bitmain, right? Yeah. You're constantly. But I don't know that Bitmain wants to do it because here's why this is a much cheaper upgrade cycle because we're just buying chips. If you're Bitmain and you're just selling these machines that become obsolete after two years, it's built in obsolescence, right? I mean, that's your industry, though. It's so it's so weird to me that that's the industry. The mining industry is create, you know, or the manuf the mining manufacturer industry is build these chips, build these machines, and there's a bunch of different companies on the knowledge that maybe in six months to a year and a half, the machines will be obsolete. I mean, how crazy is that? I think it's very crazy. And, you know, you, if you go back to last year, we were talking about what keeps me up at night. You had the price of Bitcoin decline by close to 90%. But the hash rate, because everybody had ordered their equipment in 2017, the hash rate actually went up about 180% that year. Like it was crazy. It's It was a perfect storm. So the value of what you're producing has declined by 90%. And the cost for you to produce it has increased by 180%. Think of like the economics of that were terrible for miners. And that's why a lot of guys ended up going bankrupt. What happens when a, when a miner goes bankrupt? Um, just to tell you, so one of our sponsors is a guy, his name is Scott Offord. Uh, have you heard of him? He's a, he's a Bitcoin mining broker. I have from listening to your podcast. Six, okay, cool. Six, six cents a kilowatt hour, Texas. So he, he's, yeah, right. That, I didn't know that. So he... What I like about Scott and and what I love about your industry is that um, Scott is like his business is supporting individual miners. Um, and I mean, we've sat and talked about who his clients are, who he helps broker. And it's really cool following his Twitter because you get a little bit of an insight into the industry about like what's going on uh, in the world of, of mining. So like when miners are going bankrupt, he'll post like... Um, pictures and, and, uh, you should talk to him because he'll, he'll constantly have machines, chips, even data centers that from one day to next are for sale. It's so cool. Not cool for the companies that have gone no. bankrupt, but it's cool in general to follow. I don't know. 
He's he was my first sponsor before we had any listeners. So yeah, I, I love him. So he, he, I think what he does is the hosting, and that's a, a, a good business model. But he he doesn't take a risk on the Bitcoin price. So he says, I know my cost of electricity is what are four cents. The cost of running it's another two. So I'm going to charge somebody six cents. You send me your equipment and pay me the you know the the fee per month, uh, and whatever is mine goes back to you. We're a little bit different. We're mining for ourselves. So we're mining and trying to keep as much of the Bitcoin as we can for the public company shareholders. Um, so it's a little bit of a different model. His model is very good too. But what happens is if somebody stops paying their fee, if they send them a bunch of older obsolete machines just because they're unaware of the hash rate moves and becomes obsolete, they could just stop paying. And then True. he's, and I've, I know this has happened to guys at host. All of a sudden, you're sitting on a bunch of you know obsolete equipment, and you might be stuck paying these monthly electricity bills. Now, same thing can happen to us, um, but at least it's it's our equipment, and we we're in control of it. Okay, so now you mentioned about holding Bitcoin. Um, with I know you can't get into too much detail, but um, a lot of people, myself included, are always asking: um, Are miners like selling the Bitcoin they're earning within seconds? Are they selling a portion of it to pay for things? Or like you said, you're holding it for how long is there? Who, who manages this treasury aspect of your business? Is there a specific person that needs specific training or is it a random accountant in your office? These are very difficult questions. Well, I, I would say I'm the sort of the, 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 oh, you're that you. <laughs> I'm that dude. I'm the dude. Uh, I mean, no, I make the decisions with my CFO. Um, so we look at our, our fiat costs and say, okay, how much money do we need? And we try and time it and then we hold the rest of it. So there's some periods of time where we have to sell everything. And there's other periods of time where we can just start, you know, building a huge inventory. Um, and so we like that because again, back to the original reason we created HUD8 to give people that easy exposure to Bitcoin without having to go and buy the underlying crypto. Um, most miners, though, I think sell their Bitcoin. You know, of the other guys that I know who are out there, they want off the risk right away. They're, it's not that they don't believe in the e ecosystem. They would just rather have the cash uh, on hand uh, for future things. Your, um, your, your chairman, Bill Tai, uh, had a quote in an article. I want to read it because I want to ask you a question on it. He said, um, that he was talking about Bitmain actually, and he said this industry, this industry's dependency on highly efficient silicon can determine who wins and loses. Part of this equation is access to capital. It's very much like oil rigs. The more you put up, the more output you're going to get. Great quote when he, you know, he's talking about Canada than TSX. I should have read it earlier, um, but I wanted to ask you about Bitmain because uh, are they your biggest, do you see them as your biggest competitor? And so now are you having to keep tabs on them? And so what do you think of, you know, the resurgence of Jihan, what's going on? I mean, it's almost like a reality show what happens to some of these companies over like, like in, in our industry. Yeah. Did you see that they had the CEO of what's minor arrested uh, last month? Yeah. What's no, I didn't know that. Uh, what's a minor, right? I didn't know yeah, that. That's I, crazy. I, I forget the, the, the parent company, but the what's minor is the thing. So he was the original inventor of the S9. And then he oh. left to create his own company about a year and a half ago. And there's been some lawsuits going back and forth. And uh, yeah, he got arrested in November in China. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, why? Why? Um, yeah. Do we know or is it just a random thing? Well, it, I think Bitmain had him arrested. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so why? I think this just goes sort of to rule of law. And, you know, this guy left the company. And I think. Bitmain maybe saw his co new company as a threat. Um, and, you know, Bitmain has a lot of strong government. Could that happen to your executives? I, I mean, going over there. And I thought I thought Bitmain wasn't on the good side of the Chinese government, or I guess they took investment from 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 China. Yeah, I mean, I think. I, you hear different things, um, but I don't think it's a secret that that Bitmain had him arrested. So do you think? I, Do you think it's like a reasonable fear for people in our industry to 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 travel to some of these countries? Like, um, I I'm genuinely I've never been to China and I'm kind of afraid to. Although I get invited every single day, I've been to China about twenty times. Um, it's real great, but not since I started doing uh, Bitcoin. 
you know, as a Canadian, there's a whole different other risk, and I'm not going to get into it. But you know, okay. we arrested the Huawei CF. I remember. Yeah, yes, I so totally they're, say they're no more. They're randomly arresting Canadians down there anyway, so I wouldn't go there right. regardless. But you know, to the question, I don't view Bitmain as a competitor. Um, I think Bitfury would view Bitmain as a competitor because. Bitmain does some mining, but their key business is making uh, hardware. It's the chips. Yeah. And, you know, I have a confession. Yeah. When I was younger, um, younger, I just turned 30, but like 10 years ago when I was traveling around Europe as as a college student, I would literally have a Canadian flag hanging from my, (laughs) that's great, from my backpack because everyone (laughs) loves Canadians, but no one likes Americans. (laughs) Um, But I have a lot of Canadian family, so I'm allowed to do that. Right. Right. Well, I Half think my family is from Canada. Did it, did it work? Did people come up to of you and welcome you as people, Canadian? People love awesome. Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders. People love everyone except for Americans. I don't know why. <laughs> well, it depends. It's where. gotten worse. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, that's funny. But anyways, I wanna, I, I, a bit means making so, good equipment. Like they, I, I can't say that their stuff is, is is bad. I think it's a different approach. But you know. What's for better or for worse, at least they're not scamming people. They're making good equipment. They're they're getting paid for and they're shipping it out. That's is what right. you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Better to have that than a scammer. That's right. I want to end off by asking you, um, and and you know, I have actually never asked this question before, but you know, we had an evolution of mining. We had CPU, GPU, and now ASIC. W- will we ever see the next evolution? Will there ever be anything that makes ASICs obsolete? Is this a quantum computer thing? Uh, where do you see us, you know, our mining industry in five years from now? The big leap from GPU to ASIC, uh, that that was huge. And every time the new ASICs came out, they were like three, four hundred percent better than the next one. Then the next generation was 150 percent better. Now the new generation stuff is kind of 50 percent better. So I think it's similar, like every time you go and you get a new phone, it's a little bit better than the last one, but it's not going from sort of that little pocket BlackBerry to, you know, a full phone. So I think the the development of ASIC chips is plateauing. Like I think most of the stuff now that the, the new stuff that's being made is seven nanometer chips, like tiny. And that was from you know twenty plus ma- nanometer chips a couple of, few years ago. So I think the the ASIC chip is plateauing. Um, in terms of the threats to the ASIC chips, what I keeps coming up is the quantum computing. Is can a computer come in here that's just so powerful that you know makes ASIC chip and, and can actually threaten the entire Bitcoin ecosystem. You know, when I talk to the guys at Bitfury and, and some of the, you know, they've got some real brilliant mathematicians and, and technologists there, they think that that's not a real threat. Um, and it's probably still six to eight years away. So when I look at sort of what's going to happen with mining over the next four to five years, the, the big thing we didn't talk about is the halving. The halving is going to have a massive impact on, on miners. And that's coming up in May 2020. Let's talk about that for a second. Um, how do you foresee the having? I mean, we've only had two other ones in the past. How is it going to affect our industry, our market now? Yeah. So the big question now is, is the having priced into the to Bitcoin or not? But for a miner, so come May 2020, the reward just for listeners, the, the reward right now, uh, every time you sell a block is, is 12 and a half Bitcoin. Uh, come approximately, you know, the middle to end of May uh, 2020, it's going to cut in half. So it's going to go to 6.25 Bitcoin for every block that you solve. So what's immediately going to happen is for every miner out there, whatever you're mining on one day for your hash rate, it's going to drop in half the next day. So it's going to essentially double your cost of mining. That's pretty scary. So what needs to happen is, and a lot of people we're not going to get into, but a lot of people will claim that the floor on the price of Bitcoin is really the cost of mining it, similar to mining gold. That cost is going to double in May. And if the price of Bitcoin doesn't catch up or, or double from where it is here today, you're going to have a whole bunch of miners where it's just going to be uneconomic for them to continue mining. Like we have very cheap electricity. So hopefully, you know, there's a lot of variables and, and we'll skate through this. But for a lot of guys out there who are paying, you know, six to 10 cents, they're not going to make it unless, really? the, price, unless the price of Bitcoin doubles. So the anticipation here is that the hash rate will probably drop. The, you know, within the next few days after the halving, the, the hash rate will probably drop somewhere between 20 and 40 percent. It was huge. That's a huge number. Yeah. Um, if if ASICs were to come, not ASICs, if if quantum computing uh, did become a thing, would the scenarios 
uh, protect us, similar to what we talked about before? That's a good question. I mean, if quantum computing is still a bit of a mystery. I mean, as I understand it, it's just this enormous computing power where you could just, you know, shovel that to anything. Like, so, could someone come in, someone could notionally come in and, and take 51% and, and launch an, a Bitcoin attack. Yeah. Um, so I, I speak to, I speak to maximalists, like super maximalists, like people who make some of the crypto Twitter maximalists that we see look like nothing. Um, and they, and I asked them like, what type of hard forks would you actually support for Bitcoin? You know, because, um, you know, like the whole big block thing. And one of the answers is always quantum computing slash hash rate slash like that aspect of Bitcoin. If something were to come online and we needed to make an emergency change to uh, prevent that from, you know, taking over our, our whole hash rate, that would be something that they'd support. So it's good to see that. I mean, the developers would know how to, uh, uh, you know, uh, very quickly increase uh, the difficulty in order to prevent like quantum computers from, but at the same time, it would make ASICs not be able to. So temporarily um, making you guys, you know, you guys will make money, but it'll prevent the industry and the whole freaking Bitcoin from collapsing. So yeah. it's a win-win, right? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I still think we're a few years away from that though. I agree. I agree. Andrew, um, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, I know it's, you know, Christmas and the end of the year is coming up uh, and you guys have so much to do, but keep on mining those Bitcoins. And if, if people are interested in, in, in following what you guys are doing, um, do you like publish a, a newsletter or a report or, or things like that, that, but normal people like, like, like myself can, can subscribe to? Well, you can go to our website. We're always publishing media on the company. It's www.hud8mining.com. Um, and I even tell you where the name HUD8 come, came from, but maybe we'll say that. But um, you can go there. We're always publishing. We don't have industry reports, but every year we publish uh, sort of an industry overview that will be coming out in March, came out in about March last year. And we sort of talk about the ecosystem and what we see happening. Um, so I purposely didn't. I purposely didn't ask you for this reason. I don't want... I want people to Google it. I want them to figure. So don't say I want uh, the listeners to not be lazy, and I want them to, to to research because it's so cool where you guys got your name from. If you're a cypherpunk or nerd or geek or you like uh, anything to do with cryptography, uh, I'll give you a hint. The name Hut Eight comes from the origins, basically, of where crypto came from. Uh, it's super cool. Thank you Thanks. so much for coming on the show today. Thank really you. I'm a, I'm a big fan of yours and I've been following you for a while. So thank you very much. It's a real pleasure. That's super flattering to hear. Uh, truly and honestly. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. New episodes of Untold Stories are released every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 a.m. EST on untoldstories.com, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Untold Stories is produced by Jason Yanowitz, Michael E. Polito, Reed Hannaford, and Riley Silbert of Blockworks Group. Our account executives are Gina D. Felice and Julie Muroff. Our content is written by Kathy Zolo, Ronnie Tishner, and Scott Offer. Special thanks to Wayne Dallaire from Jump Dog Audio Productions. And of course, I'm your host, Charlie Shrem. You can follow me on Twitter, at Charlie Shrem, to continue the conversation Send me some messages, feedback, or anything you want to say. And remember, please give some love to my sponsors, and I'll see you next week. Remember, strength in numbers and information is power.